Investor intelligence provides general information only. You should consider seeking independent advice to see how this information relates to your unique circumstances. Please refer to the terms and conditions available at investorintelligence.com.au for more. Welcome back to this week's episode of Investor Intelligence, brought to you by the team at The Property Mentors. It's your weekly podcast for all things investment. My name is Phoebe Sikowski wallace I am your host, and back with me is our investment expert, Luke Harris. How's your day tracking along, Luke? G'day, Phoebe. Great day. Thank you. Yourself? Very well, thank you. Um, I've not had a voice for about two weeks now, so it's very nice to be able to talk properly again. Um, but I'm definitely still buzzing from our work trip to Tasmania that we did last week for the day. That was so much fun <laughs> for our um, eighth birthday. So for those that are listening, uh, we, we went to Tasmania for the day. We did a quick day trip down from Melbourne uh, to celebrate the Property Mentor's eighth birthday. So really proud of the team and the the. Uh, the results and the fantastic teamwork um, in in the the group here. We've got a really uh, amazing group of people, and uh, obviously little rewards like that going down to Tasmania and checking out Mona, which was a bit of a shock for some people. Mm. Uh, if you haven't oh, been yes. to Mona, <laughs> uh, if you haven't been to Mona, definitely get down there and um, take a trip down to Tasmania. The uh, the gallery and the the food and the cocktails, everything is amazing down there. Freezing cold, but a really really fantastic place to visit. So it was a big day for everybody, but uh, we did have a lot of fun. Yeah, cold for you, but normal for us Melbourne people. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, Luke, we were going to do an FAQ episode today, um, but there was a great question that someone had submitted that I actually thought could kind of lend itself more to an episode of its own, uh, and that's all to do with stamp duty, which I don't think we've spoken about it at all in the past. I know we've at least said the words stamp duty, but you know this is one of the costs that you will come across when purchasing property and many other things, and it can be a complicated thing to wrap your head around. Would you agree? Yeah, look, it is. And I think a lot of people sort of accept the fact that stamp duty is a thing, but they don't really understand why they pay it or, or how to calculate it. Right. So it's, it's definitely worth discussing so that people understand how stamp duty fits into the overall property acquisition. Yeah, definitely. So I think in that case, we'll do what we did with the positive and negative gearing episode and just kind of do like a little 101 slash beginner level episode. And, you know, in future, we can maybe do one that's a little bit more in depth. How does that sound? Sure. Hmm. So let's get started. So the the question that was originally submitted um, by Beck, so thank you very much, Beck, for this. um, And that was, what is stamp duty and why do I have to pay it? I've wondered that for the last 20 years, um, <laughs> as in the second part of that question mostly. Um, stamp duty really is a state government tax. So obviously when you're, um, when you're paying your income tax, that's obviously uh, a, a federal government tax. And when you pay your local council rates, that goes to your local council, that's a tax as well. Um, but essentially um, the state government is, uh, is largely collecting your uh, stamp duty basically on the transfer of land. It's not on the transfer of a building as such. It's always the land transfer that triggers stamp duty to be payable. And really, it's it's not a, a very effective tax from my perspective. Um, it, it means that it's only payable when you uh, transact land, uh, when, you, when you purchase land. And um, really, for the huge cost involved, it actually creates quite a burden for people uh, getting into the market or wanting to downsize and buy a, another property. It, it really adds quite a, a lot of money to the actual purchase of a property. Okay, so you're saying it's got more so to do with the land. How does it how does it come into when it has to do with property then? So basically when you purchase a property and you say, let's say you buy a property for $500,000, uh, the transfer of the land is what triggers the stamp duty to be payable and it's calculated mm-hmm. on that $500,000 price. So if you go to the State Revenue Office government uh, website, Typically in Victoria, for example, it's sro.vic.gov.au and there's similar websites across every state and territory. And basically what that'll do is you put in the purchase price, you'll put in the uh, the, the date 
of the uh, the sale or the transaction. And what it will do is it will spit out a, a figure for your actual stamp duty. Uh, and it'll show you how much you have to pay. And essentially your lawyer or conveyancer will calculate the figure and make sure that that's paid by you at the settlement of the property when the transaction takes place. And it goes straight to the state government and they put that, well, they're supposed to put that into infrastructure, roads and uh, public transport, schools and uh, and things like that, hospitals. Um, but at the end of the day, of course, it just goes into the state government coffers. And state governments love, um, love stamp duty revenue because it makes up a huge percentage of their, their annual revenue. And uh, obviously, that's why it's such a political, uh, I guess, a hot potato. Nobody wants to uh, change the, the the stamp duty rules in a state government level because it just brings in so much money for the state governments. Mm. We will touch a little bit on that um, slightly political side a bit later. But so when it comes to stamp duty, does it differ for types such as new or off the plan or existing? It, it does a little bit. In As a rule, it doesn't. Uh, and the reason I say that because um, there's going to be a, on a case-by-case basis, there's different uh, different requirements, such as uh, you know, in some states, for example, when you're buying a brand new property uh, in a certain area, if you're buying a brand new property in a regional area, you might get a stamp duty concession, uh, which is basically a discount, uh, and that can be because the state government's trying to encourage people to move to regional areas, so they might offer a bit of a discount. Uh, there's obviously first home buyer discounts and concessions available, uh, and there's different states have got their own policies and and uh, uh, opportunities for investors, uh, sorry, for first home buyers to to get into the market by having either reduced or paying no stamp duty at all, uh, and that's a state government uh, incentive to get first home buyers out there in the marketplace. Um, but obviously, when you're buying in certain areas, there can be incentives offered by state governments for uh, under a certain price point. Different postcodes in Victoria, for example, uh, in the CBD and around the CBD, they've got a fifty percent stamp duty concession to encourage people to come back into the city to buy property again. Uh, and that's obviously a, a flow on effect from the pandemic. They want people to come back and buy a property there to stimulate the economy in the city mm. and get people back out there going to cafes and restaurants and getting the city back alive again. And so that that's on until the 30th of June this year, which is a 50% um, discount on on um, on properties near the city in the CBD. So it depends on a case-by-case basis. There's no general rule that you can rely on other than uh, keep an eye on each market that you're looking at um, because from the state government um, perspective, things can change. Um, and mostly uh, when you're looking at for opportunities, sometimes you can get opportunities for stamp duty savings from the actual developer themselves. And a lot of the developers, especially for new property, uh, are offering to pay sometimes some or all of the stamp duty on a particular property. And that can incentivize people to come in there and buy the the property because it means that they're not paying it to the state government and the developer is essentially paying that for them. And there's various reasons why they will do that. Obviously, if we're, you know, we're in June now coming up towards the end of financial year, developers might need a handful of extra sales before the end of financial year. And for them, it's about, you know, getting to a certain target to appease their investors or their um, you know, their sales targets or whatever needs to be done. There's different targets that have to happen. And there's other things that happen behind the scenes as far as once we hit a certain number of sales in our project, then we can go and buy another project. And so it's not necessarily mm. about, um, you know, it's not necessarily about the money. It's about getting the result. And if the result is to get some more sales and to get some more sales, they have to pay the stamp duty. Then often that can be something that, um, that can be a win-win for the developer and for the end purchaser. Um, you've got to know where to find those deals. You've got to know who to speak to and and how often to how often they do come up and also what time of year to come up. Um, uh, end of quarter, end of financial year, uh, start of the year, you know, January when sales are a little bit slower for some developers in some areas, they can offer things like that. Um, but stamp duty really is, for me personally, I've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in stamp duty over the years. Um, it's not a tax that I like paying. If we had no stamp duty, I think that would change things quite a lot. But uh, yeah, I do. I do think it's a, it's an inefficient tax because it prevents people from moving around. And a lot of older people that want to downsize, their only asset is the family home. And if they sell the family home, they've got to pay stamp duty tens of thousands of dollars again to downsize into a smaller property. So that's holding a lot of people 
uh, in their existing homes and, and they choose mm. not, to, not to downsize because of the huge uh, stamp duty costs. Do you have a question about investing that you'd like answered? Each month we take questions from our listeners and put them to our resident expert, Luke Harris. With more than two decades of residential and commercial investment experience under his belt, Luke has seen the best and the worst of the property market. Have a burning question you want answered on an upcoming episode? Visit investorintelligence.com.au forward slash questions and ask us today. And I know it goes by some different names depending on which state you are in. So I know there's property transfer duty or just transfer duty. But it, the, so the process is um, the process of stamp duty is different state by state. Well, the, the, generally it is around the same. The actual price that they the the fee that they charge is different on a state by state basis. For example, Queensland mm-hmm. is is a lot cheaper for stamp duty than it is in Victoria. Uh, Victoria mm-hmm. is one of the more expensive. Um, states to do uh, to pay stamp duty. Uh, New South Wales again is is more expensive than you would get in Queensland. Uh, but on a state by state basis, it is it is um, it does vary. There's no uh, blanket rule. But the best way is to go to the state or territory websites. Generally, a state revenue office uh, of some sort that will will charge that. You go to their website. They have calculators online. And you can mm. compare state by state, but I certainly wouldn't be making any investment or purchase decisions based on the stamp duty alone. Uh, I wouldn't be saying I'm only going to buy in Queensland because Queensland's cheaper. Uh, when you're talking about a five hundred thousand dollar property, you might save fifteen hundred dollars. So mm. it's not it's not the end of the world uh, to pay a little bit more in other states. Uh, it's certainly not going to make you millions of dollars by saving a little bit just by buying in in some of the states that charge less uh, less stamp duty. But uh, I'd certainly be making your decision on what's a good investment first. And then the stamp mm-hmm. duty really for me is a cost of doing business. I don't like paying the cost, but it is a cost <laughs> of doing business and you have to uh, you have to do that. Yeah, yeah, it just comes part with it. So, so does the rate or the percentage of stamp duty ever change um, sort of like in the same way something like interest rates do? Generally not. So the stamp duty uh, rates are, are relatively fixed in most most areas. Okay. Uh, they do change them from time to time and they can change. So it certainly wouldn't be saying that they never change. But stamp duty is very much um, a, a solid figure that you can rely on. It's not going to go up and down like interest rates, for example. Uh, and at the end of the day, you can't, If even if it did go up, you can't challenge it anyway. You have to pay it. If they decide to double the stamp duty rate, then that's what they'll do. They'll obviously... Uh, massively affect the economy if they if they do change it to that level, mm. but uh, the governments uh, might tweak the stamp duty rates from time to time. But it's not something that we have to really be worried about. Uh, it's really, as I said, it's a cost of doing business. The fee is what it is, and uh, obviously, if you can make some savings on the property and potentially get some uh, some discounts somewhere, then by all means, take advantage of them. But don't make your decision based on the stamp duty alone. Mm. And we've just had a change in government, um, obviously. Is it likely to change anytime soon? Well, that's a federal government uh, changeover that we've just had. So they will not be touching stamp duty because it's a a state government tax. So um, there might be some influence on property reform over the next uh, term of this government, but uh, it's certainly going to be up to the states to, to make any major changes. Um, as far as uh, political will to change stamp duty on a state by state basis, there's definitely been more talk of it over the last five or ten years because as property prices have gone up, of course the percentage hasn't changed on stamp duty and people are still paying tens of thousands of dollars. Um, you know a million dollar property can cost you fifty thousand dollars in stamp duty. And that's a huge mm-hmm. chunk of your actual cash to just to purchase a property. Um, so there's been talk of, and and I support a broad-based property tax where not just investors and, and per- people purchasing a property will be charged a, a, like a stamp duty tax on the transfer of land. It's an annual tax that's charged to everybody that owns a property. So instead of Phoebe, you go and buy a property for a million dollars, you're up for $50,000 in stamp duty. Um, I'd like to see that uh, you instead get charged maybe $1,000 a year for your property and you mm. don't pay stamp duty on the way in because then at least if, you've, if you're a first home buyer trying to get into the market, um, there are incentives for first home buyers. But even if you're a second home buyer 
Uh, you might have been through a, a, a marriage breakup or something like that. You've got to go back out into the marketplace. Um, and it happens a lot. People change their situation and they've got to go back out and buy a property. Even if they got the first home buyer's grant, they're not going to get it the second time around. So people's circumstances mm. do change. They change jobs. They move into state. And stamp duty is a huge burden. So a lot of people, they might have the deposit there, but they don't have that extra $20,000, $30,000 for stamp duty. So they end up going out there and renting. And that's putting uh, people more pressure on the rental market. It's uh, preventing people from moving around, buying a property where they would normally buy. They have to go out and rent instead. Uh, and so if we take away the burden of the stamp duty cost, it allows people to, to move freely around the property markets. It gives us a little bit more of a balanced market because people are not having to come up with that cost every single time. And then, of course, if you've got your deposit there, you can go and buy a property and uh, you, know, you pay an annual tax on your property, uh, whether it's a land tax or something similar. Uh, at the moment, land tax is only paid to investors or to companies and trusts. It's not charged on the family home. So if you've got a family home, you can sell that property without paying any capital gains tax. Uh, you can uh, stay in that property and um, not have to pay any land tax. So the thing is that um, if we have a, a broad-based tax where every property owner in the country pays a fee to the mm. state government instead of a, a, a once-off um once off stamp duty, I think that's going to be a more productive system because, and it's all also um, a more reliable income for the state governments. But that's that's going to take quite a bit of uh, political will to change that and introduce it. And I think there's going to be mm. a lot more changes in that space over the next decade. But uh, to a certain extent, it's uh, a wait and see. Yeah, yeah. the The annual fee sounds a lot better than the big, big fat chunk that you'd have to put forward right at the start. That's for sure. Well, the fee that I proposed was was around a thousand dollars. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be that. So we might be, mm. you know, shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit if I say we have an annual fee and we find out that it's five thousand dollars a year. That's a different story. Um, mm. But at the end of the day, it's got to be a, a, a something that the politicians can convince the public that it's a good idea. And of course, with most people that are in their houses, in their in their homes, I should say, um, most people aren't looking to move. Most people are in their homes already. A lot of people have already paid stamp duty and they're going to live in that house for the next 20 or 30 years. So they're going to be upset if a new tax is brought in when they've already paid stamp duty. So it's not a black and white changeover. Um, potentially, yeah. it will be you'll pay stamp duty up until a certain date. If you purchase a property after a certain date, then you pay the annual uh, fee. But as I said, that could be a thousand dollars. It could be five thousand dollars. Who knows? So I'm not the mm. economist, so I, uh, I yeah. won't <laughs> make assumptions as to how much it will be. Uh, but I believe mm. that something around a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars, very similar to your council rates that you'll pay, uh, I think would be a little bit more productive for state governments. But as I said, I'm not the treasurer and I'm not an economist, so I'll uh, <laughs> uh, I'll say watch this space and see what happens. Maybe you should be. <laughs> would that be a good idea no no i much prefer to do i prefer to do what i do <laughs> good to hear so you have sort of talked about it throughout this but are there any ways that you can save on stamp duty or you know talk to me a little bit more about these kind of concessions and exemptions look it's mostly for owner occupiers and the the key areas that uh, state governments are trying to support uh, first home buyers getting into the market. So there's concessions if you purchase under a certain price point, which is typically typically around the six hundred to six hundred fifty thousand dollars in most states or territories. You'll either have a very reduced stamp duty rate to pay, or you'll pay no stamp duty. Um, that used to be applied on all properties, and governments have lately changed that to being on new properties only. And the reason they've done that is mm. because new properties uh, support the building industry. If there's building industry. Right. Uh, it's building activity, it supports the building industry, supports jobs, and there's money flowing through the economy. So again, it depends on which state and territory that you're looking at. Um, some states and territories, you, you'll get a discount up to $750,000. But after that, uh, if, you, if you can afford their view is that if you can afford $750,000 or more, you can afford to pay mm -hmm. us the stamp duty. So, right. you know, there, there is a, a cap in most areas as to, you know, what contribution or what discounts and concessions you'll get from the state government, but it really depends on on where you're buying, whether it's for investment, owner occupier, whether it's vacant land, uh, whether it has a house on it, all those sorts of things come into consideration. So there's no uh, black and white rule. As far as getting discounts, um, if you're an investor looking to save some money on stamp duty, um, first thing that we need to do is make sure that the investment itself 
has good underlying fundamentals. We need to make sure the investment itself is something that we want to hold for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. Now, if we're going to hold a property for that long, is $20,000 or $25,000 in stamp duty going to make or break that deal? Probably not. Especially if we're mm-hmm. buying an asset for five or six or $700,000, then it's a small amount of money in the scheme of things. It's not fun to pay. If we can save some money, great. But it doesn't mean I'm going to change the underlying investment to an area that gives us a, a stamp duty concession. Um, mm. There used to be a, a fantastic period of time, uh, which was for most of the uh, most of the last decade, uh, up until I think believe it, I think it was uh, 2017 or 2018 they changed it in Victoria, where you would get a stamp duty discount for owner occupiers and investors for buying off the plan. So that was in Victoria, you would get a stamp duty concession and it was based on the value of the land at the time that you signed the contract. Now, if you look at a house and land, for example, uh, if you were to buy a, um, a completed house and land package and that was, let's say, $500,000, let's say the land value was 250000 you would pay the stamp duty on the land value only if you bought that property off the plan. Same as an apartment, apartment at $500,000, you have less of a land component so the land might have been valued at $150,000. You'll pay stamp duty on that only because that's what the land was worth at the time of construction. And obviously, as construction progressed, you would pay more and more because there's been more value added. Um, but unfortunately, those days are gone. This, uh, the state government realized that they were giving away too much money in, in these off-the-plan uh, concessions. But obviously, that supported mm-hmm. uh, quite a building boom in Victoria in um, in the last decade. And obviously, that ended you know four or five years ago now. But it really was a window opportunity for a lot of people to buy off-the-plan in that time. And it saved people tens of thousands of dollars. And at the same time, it supported building and construction activity in Victoria. And if you drive through Melbourne... Now you'll see all of the activity and the construction that's happened over the last 10 years and it's a very different city to what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago now. A lot of mm. new construction and obviously that population growth has actually filled those properties. Um, Melbourne's yeah. population is bursting at the seams. There still isn't enough property to meet demand in Victoria and other parts of the country as well where we're simply not building enough homes. So there may be other incentives introduced for off the plan sales obviously there's some issues in the building industry at the moment with a lot of big builders uh, having some financial concerns um uh, that's a podcast for another day i think but mm. uh you know i think um the industry will sort itself out and as far as stamp duty is concerned as i said i wouldn't be making any decisions based on the stamp duty alone i'd be looking for the underlying investment first and if the investment stacks up with the stamp duty payable then of course you you pay the stamp duty I certainly wouldn't be waiting on the sidelines for you know state governments to change their policies around stamp duty. If they do make changes to that, they'll be incremental changes that certainly won't be overnight. And there's no talk of it happening right now, so I certainly wouldn't be sitting on the sidelines waiting. If you do, you might cost yourself quite a bit of money in, in waiting while property prices continue to rise. Uh, and so don't make your decisions based on the tax alone. Mm. And who in your team of experts is the best person to talk to about all of this? Well, generally, there's going to be a number of people that you'll have the conversation about. Uh, When you've actually uh, factored in your loan costs, you'll be speaking to your mortgage broker who will discuss Mm. stamp duty costs as far as your deposits, your servicing and borrowing capacity. So your broker will generally cover all that off with you first. Uh, Once you've actually signed a contract, uh, whether it's subject to finance or if it's an off-the-plan contract you'll speak to your conveyancer or solicitor they'll confirm the the figures but as i said you can go to those state government websites and do a a costing for yourself if you know the purchase price of the property that you're looking at put in the figures put in the date of the contract or the expected date of the contract and that'll generally spit out um, the the end result for you and they'll ask you a couple of questions whether you're a first home buyer whether you're an investor uh, whether you're uh, buying in a company or trust, a lot of those questions come up. And uh, also, if you're an overseas buyer, if you're an overseas buyer, mm-hmm. then you can often pay uh, a slightly higher stamp duty. And obviously, if you're a foreign investor, even more uh, that you can pay. So if you go through those online calculators, that's going to give you a very, very good guide. Um, to get an exact figure, you'd want to go to your conveyancer or your lawyer who will give you the exact figure on your um, on your settlement figures. Okay, very good to know. Now, Luke, to wrap up, is there anything else that you think people should know about stamp duty? 
Look, it, it, the, the thing with stamp duty is, is it's got to be paid. There's not a great deal that you can do to avoid it. You certainly shouldn't be trying to avoid it. Um, mm -hmm. Be mindful that if you're purchasing in a company or trust structure, um, that obviously there's, there's um, different stamp duty um, rules that apply there as well, as, as, as well as land tax as well. Um, but I think the best thing is just to accept the fact that it's a cost of doing business. Uh, where there are yeah. opportunities to to save stamp duty, then by all means uh, consider those. But of course, consider the investment in the underlying asset first, uh, because if you're purchasing the right asset and you're holding it for the for the right amount of time, could be 10, 20, 30 years or more, make sure that you're um, you've got the right asset in the portfolio. The stamp duty cost will will wash away over time because you've made more money on the mm. property, more money on the asset than the stamp duty has ever cost you. Yeah, love. Well, big thank you to Beck, the listener who actually submitted the original question that was the inspiration for this episode. Um, and if you do have any questions that you want answered by Luke on an upcoming FAQ episode, or even if you just want to inspire a topic for one of our episodes, you can visit investorintelligence.com.au. Thank you so much for listening. I will be back in your ears again next week. And Luke, as always, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Phoebe. Have a good week.